So we're already at, in two weeks or three weeks since our last time we met. Uh, so uh, that's where we are. Uh, uh, Jules just asked, so just to clarify, we are uh, still near the beginning of the ninth chapter. We're in chapter nine, verse number six, uh, for those who want to find the place before we get started. Uh, before we begin, let me drop our uh, link in the chat. So there's the link there to our website if you'd like to catch up on anything or um, or review anything that's all there. Uh, so yeah, please feel free to do that. And without any further ado, we will now begin again. We are uh, going to chapter nine, verse number six. And let me put that on the share screen. And there you go. Okay. You know what? I can make this a little bit bigger. There you go. I don't think I can afford to make it any bigger than that. But that should be good. Okay. You're welcome, Myra. I can see you're excited about it. <laughs> so um, to review just where we've been, uh, we've been discussing these opening verses here of chapter nine. Again, that's Kohela chapter nine. Uh, and we have been seeing this interesting contrast that he's been giving us between uh, group A and group B. Okay, Group A includes the wise people and the righteous people and those who are close to them. So we always thought that was a kind of an interesting thing that he uh, I, he showed us, I think it was in the first verse over there, is that he, he seems to indicate that these two groups are together and not just them, but those who are close to them, which kind of makes sense as we'll see, um, that those who are close to wisdom or close to righteousness uh, are likely to have get rubbed off on. You know, they'll, they'll get some of that wisdom or righteousness rub off on them too. And they'll begin to appreciate things differently also. Because what we found was, if they're in group A, so then group B is really kind of your average person, you know, not particularly wise, not particularly righteous, okay? Um, and that, and he contra contrasts these two groups of people uh, and kind of, kind of uh, extremely, I would say. Uh, on one side, you've got the righteous and the wise, which again, it's kind of strange bedfellows, if you will, um, because you know wisdom doesn't necessarily say anything about a person's righteousness, and righteousness doesn't necessarily say anything about a person's wisdom. Uh, but they hang out together in this sense. Uh, and then on the other side, you've got your average person, and they look at the way that things fall out in this world differently, and particularly in the sense of how uh, everyone's ending up in the same place. You know, at the end of the day, we're all going to end up in the same place. Uh, you know, God willing, I guess you could you could put it, right? We all live our years here in this world. And at some point, we're going to move on to something else, uh, you know, again, to put it lightly. And he, he the way he puts it is that you have a, the, the side B, I would, let's start with the second side, you have your average person who says, you know, what's really the point of everything anyway, kind of this exist existential crisis that they go through. If everybody, doesn't matter how righteous or wise you are, you're going to end up in the same place as the poorest fool around. So then what's the point of everything? And that's actually, I would say that's an important question. It's a necessary question that it would almost be disturbing if a person never asked that question, I would say, right? Well, always kind of, you should have some sort of existential question at some point in your life where like, why, it, what is the point of everything if it's all going to the same ultimate end? So he says, those, those people get stuck on that point. And they, uh, what they, happens to them is that they end up with a life that is solely focused on death. That's solely focused on that one thing and says, what's the point of everything if it's all going to end in the same place? Well, the question, the response would be, are you at the end? No, you right now are living. You right now are experiencing your life. So why waste it thinking about how it's going to end? Um, is I guess that's one way, to, how I would put it. And so what he wants to point out is that the wise and the righteous, they know they're going to die, but that doesn't stop them. That doesn't bring them down. In fact, on the contrary, it brings them up. It motivates them to do more with their lives. Okay, so verse five over here, again, that's chapter nine, verse five said that the living know that they're going to die. But that doesn't that doesn't change anything necessarily. The dead, and by the way, he says the dead over here, the living dead, the people who are dead while they're still alive, they don't know nothing, right? They know nothing. Um, 
and they there's nothing else for their lives, right? So because if they're so focused and so myopic about this one point that you know it does nothing's worth it because it's all heading to the same place, well, that's that's unfortunately not a way to live, <laughs> you know, to put it to put it like that. Not a way to live because that's not a life affirming uh, mindset. Okay, so this verse number six, which is where we're up to right now, is kind of the ending of their way of thinking. Okay, uh, and then we'll move on. Verse number seven is going to come back to righteousness. Okay, or, or wisdom, one or the other. So uh, verse number six says like this. Let's read it inside first. And he says like this: Gam avatam, also their love. Gam sinatam, also their hatred. Gam kinatam, even their jealousy, kvar avada is already lost. The chelak ein lehem od, they no longer have a portion. La olam in the world, the chol asher nasa tachat hashamesh, for all those things that are done under the sun. Okay, let's read that one more time. Gam avatam, also their love. Gam sinatam, also their hatred. Gam kinatam, even their jealousy, kvar avada is already lost. They have no more portion of the world. For all, the, all those things that are done under the sun. So there's our usual, our usual hint right there. Things under the sun. Keep your mind focused right now on this worldly uh, uh, endeavors. And still, the person who doesn't see, get this understanding doesn't realize that light death is a motivator, not a downer, I would say. It's a motivator. So he doesn't understand that and is going to be focused on that entirely. That person is going to lose their things even in this world. They're going to lose out even on the opportunities in this world. Here there's a, a famous story that a, a rabbi, a great rabbi, Rabbi Aaron Cutler, Aharon Cutler, um, who was the founder of the Lakewood Yeshiva, if that means anything to you. Um, he's, if, to put it into perspective, to me, he is my rabbi's rabbi. Okay, so he passed away in the 1960s. Um, but he, uh, somebody once told him, you know, if reward wise, you know, you get as much reward for supporting Torah study as you do for learning Torah, for studying Torah itself. So then why should I bother studying Torah? I'll just, I'll just support it with my money. And so Rabbi Keller looked at him and said, I don't, yeah, you'll get reward in the next world, but what about this world? You know, yeah, you miss, you lose the opportunity of perfecting your, your mindset in this world. And it's kind of a, a deeper thought than it comes off as for, at first glance. With engaging with wisdom and engaging with righteousness or, or perfection or, or trying to reach those things, a person can actually re attain levels of better life in this world, a more fulfilling life in this world. So there's a number of things I want to point out in this, in this verse over here. Number one is he brings back the idea of love and hatred. So it's been a long time because, again, we had a couple of times that we've had to break for a week at a time here. But if you go back to verse number one in this chapter, he said that the average person doesn't understand love and hate. Right. The average person does not understand love and hate. The love and hatred that average people don't understand, the wise and the righteous, they understand. OK, so here we have finally. I, I mentioned this at a time, love and hatred comes back later in the chapter. Well, here it is, okay? Love and hate show back up again, all right? And they, they, and he's telling us, your average person, if you don't have wisdom, you don't have righteousness, you're not going to understand fully love and hatred. And you kind of look at it like this, is that if we're talking about being motivated to do things with our lives, so there's, I would say there's really three things that motivate a person, Okay. Number one is love, okay? A person is motivated to do things because of love. They do things because they love to do it. They want to do it. They have a connection, a soul connection to something, right? People who work with the unfortunate or people who work for justice, or right? those are things that they are, they are an emotionally charged reason to do something. Or even somebody who's a, doing a good job at their you know, desk job or bricklaying, they do it because they love the people that they work with, right? That, that they were working for, I'm sorry, right? So they're motivated by love. Love would be the first motivator in life. So somebody who's, who allows death to demotivate them, so then they clearly don't understand it. They're not, they're not even being attuned to with love. Lo love is not something that's motivating them. 
right? The second motivator, great motivator in life is hatred, okay? Uh, we, we see this plenty uh, when, when, let's say, wars and things like that, right? So hatred is a, is a, is a tremendously powerful motivator, right? If you were to be a, uh, if we were to look at this from a marketing perspective. So these are two great options for how you would want to get somebody to go out and do something or buy a product, right? Either because you want to hit them in the love or you want to hit them in the hate, right? There, you know, think about two types of political ads, right? There's the vote for Johnson because Johnson's an amazing guy. And then there's the don't vote for Johnson. Johnson's a terrible crook, right? Uh, so those are your two, typically your two types of, uh, of political ads because those are tremendous motivators. That's what gets people out to vote, gets people out to buy, to purchase, to do things like that. Is again, on one hand, love. And on the other hand, you have hatred. The third great motivator would be kina, would be jealousy. Okay, uh, jealousy can show its face in multiple ways. It can show its face as greed. It can show its face as um, just simple jealousy. Right? You see somebody else who has something that you want, so you're going to be motivated to get that thing. It's not necessarily the same thing as love, and it's really not necessarily the same thing as hatred. It's not that you hate the guy, so you want the things that he has. It's not that you love the thing that he has necessarily it's 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 its own motivator um and so none of these three things if a person is bogged down by the thought of death by the thought of uh you know well the end if the end is one way out of what's the rest of it mean well then you're not allowing yourself to be motivated by any of these things love hatred uh jealousy none of these things are motivating the person so when he says this type of person all three of these great motivators in life, these three things are a vada, they're already lost. All right, this person has lost their motivation or they're demotivated, unmotivated, demotivated. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, they're not motivated uh, by the things that should motivate a person. And the result of that is v'chelek in lehem od la'olam, they lose their portion in this world, okay? They lose their 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 claim to anything in this world a chelek is a, a portion so meaning the 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 uh, I, the unspoken idea over here is that a person has a portion in this world right you have the things that you claim to be yours that you sign your name onto they're yours well if the person's unmotivated they're by nature going to lose their claim on those things too Okay, they can no longer say this is so and so's thing. So and so doesn't care about it anymore, right? He's unmotivated. That person is unmotivated to engage with this world, engage with things in this world. And so, for that reason, the person loses chelak. They lose their portion. Um, an interesting aside: we very much talk about the idea of a portion in the world, uh, particularly in Jewish thought. We talk about the portion of the world to come, right? So we say, uh, for example, the 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 sages point out. In the ethics of the fathers, they say that is that where it is? No, I'm sorry, it's it's not ethics of the fathers. It's in uh, Mako, uh, but it says that every every Jewish person has a portion in the world to come. Uh, so just kind of as an aside, you see that there's also there's something that there's a portion, there's an allotment that just by nature of who you are, that you're a Jewish person, you're connected to our tradition, everything like that. You're you're by nature expecting something in the world to come. Well, portions require motivation. Uh, to claim, stake your claim, you have to have some sort of motivation. Uh, and so in that sense, that's kind of just a, 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 a motivation itself to, to, to be motivated to claim that portion that a person has in the world to come. But we're not focusing on the world to come necessarily. Uh, we're really talking about down here. Again, that's reiterated in the last in the last step and the last words of this verse over here is that down here, the person's portion, forget the world to come. Forget, uh, you know, existentialism or anything like that. If a person is, allows themselves to be so myopic and focus on that one point in their life, they're not going to be motivated by anything else. Well, then they're going to lose out on the time that they spend here. And if, we, if you remember, we read last time, I read you uh, a passage from Rabbi Soloveitchik where he said that really Judaism is a very, is a very uh, this worldly religion. We want to get the most out of the life that we're living here. Um, so that's something that is really important. And again, it's a sign of wisdom. So now he's going to take us back to wisdom. 
back to or wisdom and righteousness group a right our 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 good guys in this in this uh so to speak uh, uh binary okay you've got the the other guys who are the righteous and the wise and they that moves us back to verse number seven over over here now this is a very interesting verse um because he tells us what does the righteous person what is his words to the righteous person so you've got You've got this group of people, the the unfortunate people who don't get how to motivate themselves. So they're not going to have an appreciation of this world. They're not going to get the most as they can out of this world. So now King Solomon, in a very personal statement here, turns to the view to the reader and speaks in the in the in the second person. He says, "You," I'm speaking speaking directly to you, uh, which is very interesting. I don't. I would have to look back and see if that's something that he often does, or if it's kind of a, a one-time piece over here, or if this is the first time that we're seeing this. And he says, Leich, you go, a person should go, Achol mecha, and eat your bread with happiness. Tov and drink your wine with a good heart. Kikvar ratzaha elokim et ma'asecha, because God has already, has already desired your actions. Okay, let's read that again. Leich, you should go. Echol besimcha lachmecha. Eat your bread with happiness. Yeah, that's that Hebrew syntax. Echol besimcha lachmecha. You should eat your bread with happiness. Usei belev tov yinecha. And drink your wine with a good heart. Ki chivar ratzah elokim et masecha. Because already God has desired your actions. Okay? Chivar, I believe we've had that before. Chivar means already. Okay? Uh, it's its own root, as far as I know. Uh, so again, that uh, so th this verse tells us that what is what is the, what does he tell to the righteous to the to the wise and the righteous? He tells them, "Go eat your bread and drink your wine in happiness and good heart." Now, that's an interesting thing, because again, perhaps you may have walked away from reading Kohelet originally, saying, "You know, everything is futile; nothing is worth is worth anything." He seems to be giving you a very different message over here, and that's that if a person does engage with happiness, uh, sorry, does engage with wisdom and with righteousness, if a person is able to motivate themselves with something besides for the fact that they know that they're going to die, they're able to use that information and use it to appreciate their life more. So that person is telling them, this person gets what happiness is, gets what a good heart is. So they'll be able to eat their bread with happiness. They'll be able to drink their wine with a good heart. I do find it, find it interesting that he switches from happiness to a good heart. I'm not sure. I don't have a good explanation necessarily why bread is eaten with happiness per se, specifically, and wine is drunk with a good heart. Um, I could spitball perhaps and just say that you know it's that wine is much more. Uh, it changes the way a person thinks, perhaps. So it gives a person a gives a person a good heart. I don't have a great explanation on that. Um, we do find a lot of connection throughout scripture uh, between wine and hearts. Um, but anyway, I'd, I'd have to think about that more. Uh, for example, we just finished Purim. Um, so it says that when the uh, king's heart was was happy with the wine, if I, remember correctly, I, think, I think I have that correctly. So again, you do have this connection between hearts and wine. I don't know. I, I personally don't like wine. So I always struggle to... To, uh, to to connect with these verses that talk about the greatness of wine. doesn't personally taste very good to me, but um, that's that's just me. Anyway, I definitely get bread. You know, good French bread, can't get better than that. You know, perfect crust, everything, that's what we're looking for. So that's, eat your bread with happiness, drink your wine with a good heart, because God has already desired your actions. And that's, that's interesting, because he just told us we're not talking about upstairs. We're not talking about some world to, you know, beyond this world experience. We're talking about here, downstairs in this world. He is saying that if a person engages with wisdom and righteousness, then you can know that the general, basic, everyday actions that a person does is, and that they do with happiness and a good heart, those things themselves are an action of that is, that is given a stamp of approval by God, which is, again, he doesn't talk about God that often. He throws them in every once in a while, so to speak. Right. But here's an interesting thing. He says, if you live your life that way, if you're motivated to do something with your life and engage with 
wisdom and righteousness. So then even these mundane things, drinking wine and eating bread, become actions that are that are desirous to God. Um, and that again is actually also a very, very Jewish concept. Uh, we find that in many, many places that by doing the things in this world, we can do, we can, we can create holiness in our in our everyday lives, right? Uh, the greatest example of that being that the the priests in the temple, the Kohanim, uh, would eat the sacrifices. They'd eat from the sacrifices. So they were doing this very mundane action, very uh, almost animalistic action of eating flesh, uh, you know, and, and, and all, but that itself was a holy action. So that shows up uh, pretty often in, in Jewish thought uh, is that we can, if you're in the right mindset, the most basic things can become holy. There's a very interesting, two, two interesting points about this verse over here. Um, is that the sages point out they they use this verse in a reference to a very specific time of year. Um, it says that when the uh, Kohen Gadol, the high priest, would exit the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. So to, to just to backtrack, the, in the temple itself, there's the Holy of Holies, the holiest room in the entire temple, uh, which contained the Holy Ark, uh, the Aron HaKodesh. Uh, so that room was so holy, the only person who was ever allowed to walk into it was the Kohen Gadol, was the high priest. And he was only allowed to walk into it once a year, on the holiest day of the year, on Yom Kippur. And he walks into it, I think, altogether four or five times throughout the day um, for different reasons. The main idea is that he's going and he's uh, burning incest and sprinkling uh, certain uh, gifts that need to be brought that one day a year. So it's a da very dangerous thing. We have this, and tradition tells us that if the Kohen Gadol was not mentally prepared for it, he would not survive the experience, right? Uh, and that, which apparently happened year after year for cer certain period points of Jewish history. So again, that's what tradition tells us. So the sages tell us that when he, if the Kohen Gadol would be able to do the entire Yom Kippur service and exit the, exit the, the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh Kadashim, at the end of it, he would make this big party at the end of Yom Kippur and invite all the all the big uh, the, the big people in in Jerusalem to this party that he made. And it says that a voice would come down from heaven. I don't know if this is a, a an audible voice or if this is just kind of a a theoretical voice. I'm not sure exactly what it means, but a voice would come from heaven and say, "This verse here: Go eat your bed in happiness and drink your wine with a good heart, because God has desired your actions." So this is kind of taking on to a a, a bigger kind of holistic uh, spiritual level, right? But that God takes this moment, this holiest day of the year, this day of Yom Kippur, and says, you did a good job. Go and enjoy yourself. And famously, Yom Kippur itself is followed by Sukkot, which is the happiest time of, of the Jewish calendar. So there's this happiness that follows this deeply introspective day of Yom Kippur, uh, which kind of brings this in idea full circle what it says is that perhaps when is a person the most wise and the most righteous in the calendar i would say that day is yom kippur a day that we spend in introspection however a person celebrates yom kippur right it, it, in tradition traditionally it's done with fasting and prayer but it's not a sad day per se it's a day of introspection it's a day of thinking about what we've done of confessing our sins of of coming closer to god so that day is in and of itself a day where we are going to engage in righteousness and wisdom. Maybe we'll be more on the level of the people who are connected, the students of the righteous and the wise. But nevertheless, we can, we, can be, we can kind of subscribe to this group and we get the, 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 the command afterwards that, you know what, you did something good, you are now able to appreciate life more. You walk away from Yom Kippur, having done the whole experience, the whole service, life means more afterwards, and it has more meaning. It's more, it's much more special. There's another interesting thing, very in the very kind of same mode uh, that shows up over here. Uh, this verse is also mentioned. If a person, we have a we have a tradition also. Uh, it's kind of funny. I, this, this is rare for me that I'm bringing in a number of traditional things at the same time but we have a tradition that if a person has suffers from terrible nightmares um so they could go and do what's called an emol emolioration of a dream uh, 
Uh, they're able to make their dream much better. They're able to spiritually improve the dream. Uh, ask your local rabbi if that's a, if this applies to you, if you are suffering from, from dreams. Um, but at the end of the process, we actually say this verse. Uh, the, the people who stand there, the guy who has the dream, the person who has the dream, says over this whole thing from uh, that you, to, to a group of three people. And at the end of it, they say, go eat your bread in happiness. But they actually switch the words. They don't say, leich echol b'simcha lachmecha. They say, leich b'simcha echol lachmecha. They switch these two words, okay? Uh, go in happiness and eat your bread, instead of go eat your bread in happiness. And the tradition tells us the reason why they would switch those letters is because the first letters of each of these words, echol b'simcha lachmecha, is aleph bet lamed, okay, which spells out Evel, Evel, which is mourning, as an M O U R N I N G, I N G. Okay, mourning. Uh, when a person is mourning the loss of a loved one, so that is hinted to Echol Besimchalach Mecha Aleph Bet Lamed. Now, okay, so this is this is Hebrew uh, numerology, Gematria, which is you know always kind of it's like the cherry on top, if you will. It doesn't it doesn't have a meaning in and of itself. But it's it's a, it's kind of a nice thought. Again, if we're looking for somebody who's going to appreciate life more after going through a period of introspection, a mourner can do that. A mourner who walks away and has gone through a loss is able to walk away or has the opportunity now to to change their cognition and to change the way they think and say, you know what? I see now that I should appreciate life more. I should take more time to appreciate the life that I have and the time that I have uh, here in this world. So again, who's going to be wiser and perhaps more righteous with their life? A mourner would probably do that. So kind of a, a little hint there in the verse that these, let, these three words start with the letters that hint to mourning. Because again, like Yom Kippur also, it's a time of introspection. It's a time of perhaps working to improve our actions those, that person is going to be able to a, a, appreciate life a little better, okay? Uh, and again, uh, find happiness, find joy in, in kind of mundane, everyday things. Um, all right, that takes us now to verse number eight. This is the last verse we're going to do today. Um, and this is continuing the same theme, right? So the guy just went, the person just went, because they have this appreciation, their, their mind's in the right place, they're able to go and enjoy the small things in life. They're able to enjoy eating bread, drinking wine, and know that it's actually approved, it has the stamp of approval by God himself. Verse number eight tells us, and there's also a very famous verse, Bechol eight, and at all times, Yehu v'gadecha levanim, your clothing should be white. Veshemet al roshecha al yechsar, and oil on your head should not be missing. Okay, once again, bechol eight at all times. Yehu v'gadecha levanim, your clothing should be white. Veshemet al roshecha al yechsar, and oil on your head. You should you should not lack. You should not lack oil on your head. So just to clarify, oil anointing oils were used as a perfume and to. Uh, for multiple reasons. The main reason would be for, for perfume. It's also used to take care of, uh, you know, itchy scalp and things like that. They would they would put oil on their head. That's just a little cultural background of what's going on there. Um, but he tells us that a person, this person, again, very personal. He's talking to you, right? He's not talking to a general crowd. He's talking to you specifically. The same person he said to eat their bread with happiness and drink their wine with a good heart He's saying, and your clothes, your clothing should be white, and your head should always have oil on. So it sounds like a like a good uh, blessing from a from a bubby or something like that, right? Your clothing should always be white, and your head should always have oil on. You know, um, so, but he's saying he's saying a, a number of interesting things over here. Um, first of all, let's talk about what the sages said. The sages point out over here that a person's clothing should always be white is an admonition that a person should always be working on self-improvement. Uh, in the general theme of the verses, this works out very well. Uh, the way that the, the Talmud pre presents it is that Rabbi Yochanan, who was one of the great sages of the times of the Talmud, 
he used to tell his students that you should always repent a day before you die. Okay, so they said, Rabbi, how do I know when we're going to die? So they said, exactly. <laughs> you should always be repenting. Okay, so repentance itself has kind of a, uh, a negative, can perhaps have negative connotation. But let's reword that as uh, a person should always be improving themselves. Um, so that's what it means. And his source for this, again, sorry, Rabbi Yochanan's source for this idea is that is this verse over here. At all times, a person's clothing should be white. All right. Now, it doesn't mean literally a person's clothing should be white. Uh, there is no, that's not necessarily a specific Jewish concept, concept that a person's clothing has to be a certain color or anything like that. I happen to be wearing a white shirt, but that has nothing to do with a religious uh, requirement of any sort. Um, you know, we're not we're not like monks or anything like that where we have to wear white robes or, or anything like that. It's just saying that a person's clothing should be clean, should be presentable. Okay. <clears throat> That person should be should not be spotted with stains on their clothing. Now, again, that could be a very literal admonition that King Solomon's saying, hey, you want to be a wise or righteous person? This is almost like a Benjamin Franklin type of thing. A wise, a wise person would never have a stain on their clothing. It happens to be the sages do say that. The sages do point out in, in, in one of their many sources that a, a Talmud Chacham, somebody who's a Torah scholar, should not have stains on their clothing. Even if nobody else can see it, but for themselves, they should never have stains on their clothing. It's not a good thing to have. Uh, it's not a good way to present yourself, and it means that you don't give yourself a proper respect either. Um, if a person's clothing is not clean and orderly, um, that's a, a bit of a personality type. But anyway, uh, so King Solomon, in one sense, is telling you literally, physically, literally, your clothing should be clean. Okay. Uh, similarly, he's saying it in a spiritual sense. Again, as the sages point out that a person should always be going through their actions and trying to figure out, are there stains on their actions? Are there things that they should be working to improve in their lives? Uh, again, you want to call that repentance. You want to call that self-improvement. It it's, all, it's all the same idea. That a person should always be doing that. Interestingly enough, is with the last verse making a shaded reference to Yom Kippur, he's saying now, always, always a person should be involved in self-improvement. Don't wait till... Yom Kippur time necessarily to be to to work on your on making yourself a better person. Always a person should be should be have a have clean clothing, uh, to put it that way. Okay, and similarly, a person should always have uh, oil on their head, uh, and that also has to do with the presentation that a person puts off, right? To have to, to be to smell good, to be well perfumed, um, is an important thing. So I heard somebody on the radio say recently, you know, if, it, if ever somebody created a time machine, you know, and was able to go back in time, I think the first thing that they would be confronted with would be the stench, right? We live in one of the cleanest times in world history. Uh, just we bathe multiple times a week. You know, we, we, were, we do laundry all the time. We are clean people, thank God. Um, but all other times in history, you had to, Work very hard to stay to stay clean, or at least smell good. Um, I remember reading once that Queen Elizabeth the first was it Queen, Queen Victoria, I think it was Queen Elizabeth the first, I think, who took two baths in her life. Um, right, so that so that's going to make a difference. Shemar Rosh Chal Yechsar is telling you that a person should always have have this pre presentation to the outside that they are good smelling, that they are coming off well. Again physically spiritually right a person should always be kind of yeah you know, what's the what's the distinction between smell and clothing perfume and clothing well clothing you can perhaps tell from a distance but it's not you can really can't see until you get close up smell is something that can travel let's think about it like this if i'm rounding a corner right if i'm coming this side of the corner you're coming that side of the corner you're going to smell me before you see me you know, if I smell good, hopefully, or in this sense, right? So these are kind of two levels of of presenting yourself to the outside. Level one is in your clothing, so that's something in your in your in your body that you are presenting to the other person. Uh, the oil, the good smelling oil, is something that happens again, kind of more uh, on the outside. So, looking at this in connection with the previous verse, so it says, "What does a wise person do?" Not just what does wise person do. What do you, the wise person reading the book of Kohelet, what should you be doing? 
So number one is you take things into yourself, right? Eat your bread with happiness. So you're taking something from the outside and you're bringing it inside. Drink your wine with good heart and you're bringing it inside. You're making it a part of yourself. So that's a very personal inside the body experience. And then on the next verse, our verse over here, he's saying, not only are you, do you present happiness? Do you present a, a good heart in yourself? But you also have this presentation to the outside. You include those around you in this. You bring a good feeling, a general goodwill to those around you. Your white clothing, your uh, good smell, <clears throat> again, physically or spiritually or, or conceptually, a person's good clothing, clean clothing, good smell, are drawing other people into the same feeling. It's saying, you know, there's something to live for. Life is worth living. It's worth uh, it's worth spending the time and appreciating the things that you have in your life. So you are appreciating things that are very personal inside our body. We're appreciating things on the outside of our body that we present to other people. Uh, and the next verse, which we're not going to see tonight, because we, we don't have time to really get started with it, is going to be actually in relationship with other people, in spousal relationships, in relationships of love. Those all the more so take on more meaning when a person is motivated by the need for life, for the, the need to uh, experience life and, and live life to the fullest. Um, okay, so again, that's verse number six, seven, and eight. Uh, these verses are telling us, again, uh, verse, verse number six was ending off the idea of what your average person says, somebody who gets bogged down by the thought of their end, of their demise, and says, what's it all worth? Kind of the, uh, the nihilist and says, what's the worth? Why is it worth anything? So that person is unmotivated. And even the things that motivate your average person aren't even going to motivate them. As opposed to you, the book, person reading the book. I, I almost feel like he's saying, if you're reading this book, I already know you're in the right, you're in the, you're in the right camp, right? If you're not righteous and wise, you're at least the student of the righteous and the wise, right? And so you person, you can eat your bread with happiness, knowing that you're motivated to live your life well. You're able to drink your wine with good heart because you're motivated to live your life well and to present yourself in the right way with clean clothing, constant, constant self-improvement, uh, giving off the right sense to other people, bringing other people into your orbit and showing them also that life is worth living. Life is very, is very, is, is enjoyable and worth living. And it's, you know, life is for, it's for the living. It's for the people who are, uh, who are going to do the most with it and not get bogged down by the end and rather live every moment uh, for what it is and for what we can do with it, okay? So again, that's verse six, seven, and eight. We will continue with nine, God willing, next week. All right, let me stop the share and come back to the room. There we go. Okay.